Marcy Engelman is the Senior Coordinator of Conservation Education at the John James Audubon Center, teaching youth about the importance of birds and their habitats, about watershed, climate change, and other environmental topics. Marcy has almost 30 years experience in museum-based education. She spent 14 years as the manager of school and scout programs at the Philadelphia Zoo, and another 14 as senior educator at the Muter, Mutter, uh-oh, Mutter Museum? No, Muter Museum, there we go. Yep. <laughs> she received a BS in wildlife and fishery sciences from Penn State and an elementary education certificate from Alvernia University. So at this point, I will turn things over to Marcy to get us started. Thanks Wonderful. for being Thank with us. Thank you so much. Thank yeah. you, Amy. And, and hi, everybody. I wish I could see your faces, but um, I am very looking forward to teaching you this evening. And again, please put those questions in the Q&A. And if I can't address them during the lecture, we'll wrap it up at the end. Um, so I'm going to pull up my presentation. There we go. Um, Great. So welcome to our presentation this evening about birds and their beaks. Um, I am going to tag at the very end a couple of slides about uh, an important event coming up and about the center where I work in case you have never been or heard of us and are interested in coming to visit. So I'm going to go ahead and get started. Okay, so um, when we talk about animals, a lot of times at um, the centers I've worked at, um, we like to focus on the animals and their adaptations. And uh, the definition of an adaptation is a special skill or attribute that an animal uh, has to help them survive and do everything that they need to do. Uh, it could be a physical trait on their body, or it could be some kind of a behavioral change uh, that uh, an individual animal has um, or a society has that they do in their daily lives. Um, so think in your heads, you know, some examples of some adaptations. It could be opposable thumbs. It could be stripes or spots for camouflage. Uh, but what we're going to focus on today is the bird's beak. Um, it is suited to eat very specific foods. And although they vary different, uh, they vary significantly in size, shape, color, or texture, they share a very similar underlying feature. Um, there are two bony projections, the upper and the lower beak, uh, the mandibles. Uh, they are covered with a thin keratinized layer of epidermis, epidermis known as the ramphotheca. Um, in most species of bird, there are two holes there called nares, which are their nostrils that lead to the respiratory system only used for breathing. Most birds do not have a great sense of smell. There's a few, but not many. Um, it can be subdivided into the rhinotheca for the upper beak and the nathotheca for the lower beak. Beaks are actually, uh, believe it or not, an adaptation for flight. Birds need to be relatively light in order to fly. So instead of having heavy teeth, birds evolve these beautifully designed lightweight beaks that are powered by strong jaws. So it is much light, much lighter than teeth to allow them to fly. So what I'm gonna do is go through some bird beaks and we will uh, learn a lot about um, what the bird eats and how that beak is designed to eat that specific food. Chose to start with uh, ducks. There are a couple different types of ducks. There's dabbling ducks and diving ducks. Um, dabbling ducks like this mallard here are the ones that you see floating long on the creek or the pond. And when they're ready to eat, they tip up like this and they go under water and they use their beak to grab some uh, vegetation. Um, their beaks, if you wanted to say, is it like something in your kitchen? It's very much like a strainer, like a colander almost. Um, they have these round tipped bills. They're kind of flat. They're about as long as the duck's head and they're deeper than they are broad at the base. 
Uh, the edges are soft because they find their food by touch. So when they go underwater, as they're moving their beaks around, they can feel the vegetation brush up against uh, their beaks, kind of like we feel with the tip of our finger. They have a little nail at the end uh, that is used for hooking or moving food items as we might use our fingernail to manipulate something. Um, what they'll do is they um, open their beaks and they take a mouthful of water and vegetation, close the beak and the water gets sifted out through those little ridges and then the vegetation is left behind in their beaks. They act like sieves, they look like teeth, but they are not. Um, so mud and water is expelled and then the vegetation is left behind. So those are dabbling ducks like um, mallards, pintails, gadwalls, um, if you've ever heard of those kind of ducks. The other types are diving ducks. And these are like uh, mergansers, grebes, birds like that, that find food by diving into the water and grabbing fish. Uh, the, beak, the edges of the beak look like little saw blades. And these are little toothy appendages on the beak that are perfectly adapted for catching slippery fish. These mergansers only feed on fish. So, and it's also um, much thinner than a mallard's beak. If you look at that mallard's beak, it's very wide and flat, but the merganser's beak is skinny and pointed and it moves much easily, much more easily through the water to catch those fish. Okay, kind of like a spear almost, but they grab those slippery fish with those little toothy appendages. Uh, one of my favorites, the raptors. As a group, uh, raptors have these uh, curved beaks that come to a sharp point. This shape allows the raptors like hawks and owls uh, and even vultures to bite, tear, and even sometimes kill their prey after catching it. Um, they do, to make this action a little stronger, they have a very specialized jaw. It hinges at the base of the beak, allowing the bird to raise its upper jaw while keeping its lower jaw still. This allows the jaw to close faster and it gives them much more power at tearing and ripping food. It's kind of like having a little knife and fork on your face there. Now, if you look at the falcon on the bottom right-hand corner, he has something called a tomial tooth. So it looks like it's a notch. It looks like the beak is broken, but it actually is a little specialized uh, notch on the, on the edge of the beak there. Sorry to be a little graphic, but um, when the falcon bites down on the neck of a prey item, that tooth fits in between the vertebra of the prey's neck and it allows them to quickly twist and kill the prey. Um, so that's kind of an identifying characteristic of falcons. Um, other hawks and owls don't have that. So it's called a tomial tooth. Herons. Um, all herons have a very large beak uh, with sharp points for spearing fish, as you can see in the left-hand picture there. Um, the beaks are also used to stir up the water and attract fish. Uh, opening and closing like this, going like this, they can stir up the sediment at the bottom and that may attract some fish to the area. Uh, they can also sometimes snatch some flying insects out of the air with the beak. Um, but if you look, that bottom picture is a really good, um, a good picture to show how they hunt. They walk very slowly through the water and their legs look like sticks to the fish that are swimming. And sometimes the fish just swim in and out of their legs. And then they just very quickly um, stab them. If you'll notice the neck is shaped like an S that is kind of pulled back and then bang like that, they're able to grab their prey. Hummingbirds, this is really interesting. Um, You would think just casual observation, their beaks look like straws, okay? Um, they look like they would just stick their beak into the, petal, the petals of a flower and suck out the nectar, but that's not how it works at all. 
Um, beginning in the um, the 19th, early in the 19th century, uh, some scientists realized that the tip of the hummingbird's tongue forks like this into two tiny little tubes. So they thought that they would drink it through capillary action. That's not true either. And turns out they actually kind of lap up water much like a dog does. They, like a piston, the tongue goes in and out very, very fast, sometimes 15 to 20 times a second. And um, the points go out and then they compress and they pull it back in and it pulls in the nectar into their beak. Okay. Um, now I wanted to show you this one. I was doing a lot of research for this and I found this really amazing bird. This is called the sword-billed hummingbird which is from South America, the Andean region. This is among one of the larger species of hummingbird. And it's characterized by this really long beak, which is um, longer than the length of its body, not including the tail. Um, it uses its bill to drink nectar from flowers. Uh, the flowers that it feeds upon have really long petals, really long corollas. So it can reach down into the base of that flower and suck the nectar. Um, but most birds, especially hummingbirds, will preen or clean their feathers using their beaks. You may have seen this before. Um, hummingbird, this particular type of hummingbird has to use its feet to scratch and preen because the beak is too long to reach its body. So I thought that was cute. Um, this is one example of one of the flowers with the long corolla that it feeds upon. Um, birds that have cone-shaped beaks, like this cardinal or this sparrow, have the ability to trap a seed, and then they have a little bit of a, like a groove in their beak that traps that seed, and then they can crack it open. Using their beak, they separate the seed from the shell, discard the shell, eat the seed. Um, so they have this very strong cone-shaped beak to crack open seeds. One's commonly found at feeders. Uh, if you are watching your bird at, birds at the feeders, watch how they, they can manipulate that seed in their beak. It's pretty neat. Many birds feed on insects as their sole food source. So their beaks complement their bug eating lifestyle. Warblers, like that yellow warbler on the left there, uh, gnat catchers and wrens have these slender tweezer-like beaks, uh, perfect for grabbing insects off of leaves and tree branches, bing, with precision. Um, other species like the swallow here, or night hawks and fly catchers, they have more flattened beaks for catching insects in the air. Tree swallows, um, in particular, like this beautiful blue bird there, are known for their air acrobatics. If you've ever seen them flying around an open field, they're catching insects. Um, a lot of these birds too, um, like night jars, they have these specialized feathers around the edges of their beaks that come out like this and helps trap the insect into their beak. Um, these birds are often attracted to uh, birdhouses, so you might want to put one of them up. Robins. Um, robins have this great all-purpose beak for catching worms and other food, other maybe ground-dwelling insects. Uh, in the fall, a lot of these birds switch to a fruit-eating lifestyle. And that beak is also very well equipped for grabbing uh, berries off of branches. All right, a pelican. This is truly an amazing beak. This beak can hold up to three gallons of water. And what the pelican does is he scoops into the water, brings up a beak full of water that hopefully there'll be a fish in, closes his beak 
and then squeezes the water out, similar to the mallard, have, except mallards don't have this large pouch underneath to be able to accommodate all that water. Um, pardon me for a second. The American white pelican um, sometimes hunts in groups to herd fish into a concentrated area and then they can just feed. So they have this, it's a guler pouch. Woodpeckers. Now this is a neat little beak. Um, a lot of people wonder why these hummingbirds, I mean, why these woodpeckers don't get a headache from pecking away at the tree. Uh, they have a very strong, powerful beak with a chisel-like tip, um, so they can pack very slowly and deliberately. And um, to be able to drill these holes with that much force and not get a concussion, um, a woodpecker beak and skull has to act like a shock absorber. The beak is covered in layers of keratin, uh, which is a protein that helps the beak stand up to compressing forces such as that beak against a tree. And the skull is thick and spongy and absorbs the rest of the impact. Um, their skulls are a little bit more flexible because they have plate-like bones. I'll show you a picture in a second um, that minimizes the damage from all that pecking. They also have a specialized bone called a hyoid. Uh, we have hyoids in our throat, but their hyoid, um, if you can see here, wraps around the back of their skull right here that acts like concrete rebar and protects the brain. The brain is also suspended in this fluid that cushions it from the blows. Again, a flexible skull with plate-like bones that can kind of shift back and forth and protects it from all that, uh, all that pressure. Okay, now this next one is just amazing. This is called a crossbill. The, the beak is actually off kilter like that. And it uses it to get into pine cones. Pine cones, for the most part, are closed, except when they're exposed to the elements like heat, sometimes they will open. But what this crossbill will do, um, their, their biting muscles are stronger than their opening muscles. So they will stick their beak in between the, uh, the petals of the, the pine cone and they close their beak and that cross beak pushes the, oak, the pine cone open, the scales there, pushes them open and exposes the seed. And then they can reach in and grab the seed. Um, this happens in a lot less time than it takes to describe it. They can extract and eat more than 20 seeds per minute, which is basically one every three seconds. So it's kind of like reverse pliers. Pliers close, these guys, when they close their beak, it crosses over and opens up the scales of the pine cone. Okay. This is a group of birds known as Darwin's finches. A lot of us hopefully you know about Darwin. Um, these are small land birds um, endemic to the Galapagos Islands. Um, there's 13 of them on the, on the Galapagos and the 14th one is the Cocos finch, which is found on Cocos Island, Costa Rica. They're not actually true finches. They belong to the Tanager family. And they thought, um, they think their ancestor is a bird known as the grass quit, which is found on mainland South America. So it's thought that this original bird, this grass quit, arrived in the Galapagos and they spread to the different islands and then they adapted and diversified to the different environments found on the different islands and their beaks became suited to eat the different foods found on the different islands. Some eat large seeds, 
some eat invertebrates, some eat other items, which I will show you in a second. Um, the finches themselves are very similar in shape, size, and color. So it's kind of hard to, at a glance, tell them apart. But there are a few differences that will help you tell them apart. That includes diet, habitat, and beak size and shape. So here's just a few examples of some of the differences between the beaks. Um, here is a neat little spectrum that shows you the differences in sizes and shapes of the beak. So you've got the large ground beak, large ground finch, the medium ground finch, the small ground finch, et cetera. Um, there's a woodpecker finch, which um, actually uses a twig or a cactus spine, like a tool to probe uh, bugs out of trees. I'll show you a picture of that in a second. Um, but this guy here, the sharp beaked ground finch. This one feeds mainly on seeds. However, the ones that are found on a couple of small islands of Wolf and Darwin often drink the blood of large seabirds, like the blue-footed booby. And this has given them another nickname. They're often known as the vampire finch. They will actually sit on the back of the blue-footed booby and peck at the skin on the back of their neck and drink the blood. I did not include a picture of that um, because it is quite graphic. This is just a neat little graph that shows you all the birds and what islands they're found on. Um, very easy to find this if you're interested. But this is that uh, woodpecker finch. And you can see he's got a little cactus spine or a thorn from a tree. And he will probe the bark to extract the different insects. Um, birds are not known for using tools. Uh, they, why not? You know, they've got one attached to their face. But uh, this is a good example of it. Uh, let's talk about some really unusual beaks that um, may not be a huge family of birds, but maybe one individual bird. This is the roseate spoonbill. This is found in southern United States and in South, Central and South America. Uh, they have a spoon on the end of their beak, uh, which is used to strain small food out of the water. It has a flat, round tip and then it sweeps back and forth in shallow water in search of small fish and invertebrates. And then it just clamps that little spoon tip down on them. This one I've seen in person, this is the black skimmer. I've seen it down the shore. Um, if you'll notice the lower beak is much longer than the top one. Now the chick that you see in the bottom right-hand corner there, the beak looks normal, but as it grows and matures, that bottom beak outgrows the top beak. And then as they hunt for fish, they drag their lower beak through the water. And as soon as it touches anything, the beak snaps shut and hopefully it's a fish. So these are really amazing birds. I've seen them down the shore. Flamingos. Um, the beak of the flamingo is designed to sweep back and forth with the head almost upside down in the water. And they're filter feeders, kind of like baleen whales. They'll scoop up a mouthful of food, close it, the water squirts out, and then the little and macro invertebrates will be left um, inside the beak. The picture on the right there, I, th I came across that and I thought it was hilarious. Um, if you ever see a cartoon flamingo, the beak doesn't open the right way. So there's little cartoons there. They have just a little bottom beak when instead the bottom beak is actually larger than the top beak. And it feeds like this. So if you go to a zoo and you see the flamingos, they feed upside down like this. The toucan. Toucan is a South American bird. 
uh, mostly fruit eater, sometimes occasionally eats small animals, insects, eggs, uses its beak like chopsticks to pick up the fruit or pluck the fruit off of a tree, tosses it up into the back of the throat. The beak is very lightweight, uh, allowing for easy flight. It weighs about 1 20th of the bird's overall weight. But if you look at the skeleton of the toucan, you can see it's much, much larger than the rest of the head. Pardon me. Another interesting thing about the toucan's beak is it allows for thermoregulation. Because they come from a very, very hot climate, they need to be able to cool down. And researchers discovered that the beak, um, when a toucan gets overheated, the blood vessels in the beak dilate and release heat. And then when the toucan wants to, to warm up, when the temperature drops, mm. the blood vessels close, retaining the heat. So it's kind of like a rabbit's ears. It helps them thermoregulate. Pardon me. I have some other neat features of bills. This is a herring gull. I'm a bird down the shore. Um, they have a little red spot on the bottom of their beak. Only adults have this. It was found through research that newborn herring gulls instinctively beg when they see a red spot, even if it's not on their mother's beak. Uh, this researcher would show them other things that had a little red spot and the babies would beg for food. So that red spot is something that the babies will peck at and it, it kind of encourages the parent to feed them. Okay, trigger warning for my next pictures. Um, I hope none of you have something called trypophobia, which is fear of holes. Um, this is a Goulian finch. The babies of many finch species have these little nodes, these little nodules called papillae on the inside and the edges of their beak. And these nodules, they, they actually kind of glow, which is pretty cool. Um, it acts like a beacon for the parent to feed the, the hungry mouths of the chicks, even in dark nest cavities these little papillae will kind of glow in the dark a little bit. And the parents can see the mouths inside their dark cavity and know where to put the food. Um, as the chicks grow and develop and they start eating without their parental assistance, the papillae start to disappear. They don't glow, uh, they're not phosphorescent, but they just reflect light, which is just amazing. Um, another bird with similar markings is the crested kua, native to Madagascar. Um, this picture of the chick there is from the Dallas Zoo. They recently hatched their first crested kua chick, and they took a picture as it was begging for food and noticed the target-like markings on the inside of its mouth. Um, again, it's believed that it helps the adult with feeding. It helps them kind of focus in on the uh, mouth of the baby. Hornbills, this is the rhinoceros hornbill, which is found in Southeast Asia. And they have this giant extension on the top of their beak called a cask, uh, C-A-S-Q-U-E. It's hollow and it's thought to amplify a bird's call kind of like if you've ever talked through like a, a paper towel tube or a wrapping paper tube and it makes your voice sound louder, that's kind of what this is like. And the giant petrel. If you can see on this, this is a seabird and it's got this ridge on the top of its beak here. It's actually the bird's nostrils. Um, this bird is pelagic. It spends most of its life out at sea and it doesn't have a lot of fresh water available to it. 
there are glands above the eyes that remove salt from the bloodstream and it drains out through this tube on the top, top of the bird's beak. It also gives this bird a great sense of smell, helping it find food and locate its own burrow in a colony. Um, all members of this group of petrels, um, albatross, uh, shearwaters, they all have these tube noses. So it reduces salt out of their bloodstream and it gives them a great sense of smell. Um, there are many, many others, but these are ones that I found particularly interesting. Uh, something else I wanted to talk to you about was the Great Backyard Bird Count. Um, this actually starts tomorrow, February 17th, and it runs through the 20th. If you're interested, just go to the website, which is birdcount.org, and it is a collaborative effort between Cornell and Audubon and some other organizations. This was established in 1998, and it is the first online citizen science project, which is also referred to as community science. Um, it is done to collect data on wild birds and display results in real time. Uh, birds Canada joined the project in 2009. And in 2013, it became a global project when we started entering data into something called eBird, which is the world's largest biodiversity related citizen science project. So it's every February for four days, the world comes together and kind of loves birds as one. And over these four days, they invite people to spend time in their favorite places, watching and counting as many birds as they can find, and then they report it to them. Uh, these observations help scientists uh, better understand global bird populations uh, before one of their annual migrations, once they start migrating north and south. Um, so if this, this is really easy to do, you can do it in your own backyard. Um, I would just recommend if you are interested in collaborating to go on this website, birdcount.org, and it'll give you information on how to participate. I also wanted to talk to you for just a moment here about the center where I work. It is in Audubon, Pennsylvania, which is just next to Valley Forge. Uh, in 2019, we built the John James Audubon Center and Museum. Uh, these are a couple pictures from the interior of the museum. Um, we have on the right side there, we actually have a picture. Uh, we actually have one of John James Audubon's uh, books, the actual books that he illustrated. Um, and every month or so, we turn the page to another book, another bird. Uh, but there's the museum is dedicated kind of half to birds and half to Audubon and his love of nature and his art. Um, so I highly recommend you come out. And also on the site, we have the historic home uh, where John James Audubon first lived when he came to America. He lived here from 1803 to 1806. Um, it was here that he met his wife. He, she lived right across the street from us. Uh, and then um, he kind of became engaged in um, nature. He became captivated by the beauty and variety of birds and he pioneered the practice of bird banding in North America while studying Eastern Phoebes. Um, and then I wanted to end with a couple of photos there. Um, the left-hand picture is Conrad, who is a blue jay that lives at the John James Audubon Center. We have a few birds that are non-releasable, rehabilitated birds. Uh, we have several owls, a hawk and Conrad. Uh, Conrad actually wasn't injured in the wild, but he was uh, imprinted. Somebody raised him illegally as a pet, and therefore he lacks the proper instinct and fear of humans to be released into the wild. Um, so we use our birds for education ambassadors. We use them for programs, things like that, so people can get to know them and learn about them. Picture on the right, that's my bird, that's Kirby. Um, Oh, perfect. Thank you, Amy. Um, okay, so uh, I'm gonna stop that. 
And I'm gonna come into the Q&A section here and see what kind of questions. Is keratin the same substance as in human teeth and fingernails? Human hair and fingernails. Teeth are made of enamel and dentin, which is a little different, a lot denser and a lot heavier. Uh, keratin is very lightweight and it does make up our, our hair and fingernails and skin. Uh, could one of these hummingbirds preen another bird? They could, but hummingbirds are generally pretty solo animals. Um, they tend not to hang out in groups like other birds might. So I would say maybe a mate might preen another mate as a bonding uh, in behavior, but they don't really hang out together like macaws might or, or parrots and preen each other. Okay, um, what other kinds of questions do you have for me? Um, it can be anything about bird speaks or just about the center. Um, we are open Wednesday through Sunday from 10 to four. Uh, the, if you wish to, to visit the museum, there is a fee. Um, we do a daily house tour of the historic house at one o'clock. However, if you just wanna come walk the um, five miles of trails, that is free. And it's open from dawn to dusk. That's wonderful. Yeah. Yay for free, yay for free institutions, right? <laughs> uh, so one question just popped up. Yep. Yep. Legs longer than a typical hummer so that it can reach all of its body. Um, birds are pretty good at, they have like long enough legs that they can reach their head. So I don't think they're any longer than a typical hummingbird, um, but they, they definitely can reach all the good spots. So we had one question, Marcy, that says, how do birds find seed feeders if they can't smell well? Um, vision. They're going to use their eyes. Um, they also can hear the calls of other birds, um, certain birds that are a little bit more They don't flock together. I mean, a lot of birds are generally kind of out on their own, um, but they will hear other birds calling and, and they may be alerted to the fact that there's a feeder nearby or they'll just watch other birds gathering at these feeders. Um, so yeah, the, very few birds have a good sense of smell. One bird that can smell well, and you may already know this, is a vulture mm -hmm. uh, because their prey doesn't move. They have to find it another way and they will smell the, the dead body. Mm -hmm. <laughs> So there's two questions here back to back about hummingbirds. Uh, would you mm -hmm. be able to share a little bit about like hummingbird, like when we would see them in the spring and then also when they would be leaving later in the year? Sure. Um, the hummingbirds are migratory and I will give you a website when I'm done talking that you could give everybody. Um, they are migratory. Um, you're gonna to tend to see them probably March. We're gonna to start to see them March um, and then they'll migrate out probably October or so. Um, I will tell you that the Audubon, Audubon just came up with something called the Migratory Bird Explorer. And I'm gonna find it so I can put the website in the chat. Let me find it on my... One, one second here. But what mm -hmm. you can do on the Migratory Bird Explorer is track different birds' migration routes. And some of them are um, individual birds. Here we go. Is this a, no. Um, they have tagged birds to follow their migration routes. And you can, um, Sorry, my computer is being a little weird, but I want to find this uh, this website for you. That's great. And I can also include um, what you're pulling up right now on the resource page for the lecture when I put everything together. So this will be oh, great. Perfect. Yeah, mm -hmm. I found it. Um, but yeah, this is a really great website. It's brand new. It just launched in September. Here we go. It's kind of got a weird website, but let me copy it. <laughs> and 
there. So if you click on that, it'll take you to the Migratory Bird Explorer and you can click on whatever species of bird you're interested in and it shows you its migratory route. And then you can also go through and you can look at um, conservation challenges that they face along the way, whether it be climate change or habitat loss. Highly recommend playing around with that one. That's great. Thank you for sharing that. And that's awesome. Yeah. That Audubon put that together. Um, a lot of work. Someone mm -hmm. was, yeah. Oh yeah, I'm sure. Um, someone asked a little bit, again, more about kind of migration. Have you noticed birds returning earlier this year because of the, the warmer temperatures? Question. Um, that, that does pose a problem um, with climate change in general. Um, I have another website too. I can give you. Um, yeah, it does pose a problem with climate change. And if you go to this other website, which is called Survival by Degrees, mm. it shows you, you can click on any species of bird that you're interested in. And then it shows you how their range, their home range changes based on um, climate change. So it, you can look at it for its, its current range and then if the, if the temperature, the average temperature goes up 1.5 degrees, two degrees, three degrees. Um, let me copy this one and paste this one in here too. That one's a lot easier. <laughs> so that one I highly recommend as well. Wonderful. Um, so you can see how climate change affects the birds' home ranges, whether mm -hmm. it goes farther north, farther south, things like that, and it affects their migratory routes as well. Okay, perfect. There's a question that many of the beaks that you showed were very colorful. Is there a reason for the color? Um, there can be. Um, now, some could be a display for perhaps a mate, uh, kind of like a peacock's feathers. Sometimes like a toucan's beak may show off its um, strength and its uh, health. It could be an indicator of good health. Um, so that could be one reason. Another reason could be perhaps um, that same strength may threaten a rival bird. It may say I'm bigger and stronger than you. You wanna stay out of my territory kind of like songs do too, but those are a couple of things that why the beaks could be so brightly colored. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. And that actually uh, goes into this next question, which is do birds mm -hmm. ever use their beaks for, de for defense? Absolutely, absolutely. Um, some may bite, some kind of almost like sword fighting like that. Um, so sometimes, yes, they can use them for fighting. Okay, great. Are penguin beaks closer to dabbling ducks or diving ducks? Or maybe neither. <laughs> mm, I did not include penguins in this. Um, they are solely fish eaters because that's all that's available to them uh, where they live for the most part. Um, so they would be closer to a diving duck, little serrations on the edge. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What else? Last year, there was a disease that killed many birds. Is that still an mm -hmm. issue for backyard birds? Yes, avian flu is still a big issue. Um, we have to we have make, taken countermeasures against that at the Audubon Center um, the, where our birds live. We actually have made that off limits to visitors because you could easily track in something on your shoes, and then it could get contaminated into their contain their, um, their enclosures. So um, yeah, avian flu is still a big deal. I think recently they have found a couple of um, colonies of ducks that have been affected by it. So it's still out there. So we, ha we have um, measures that we take uh, when we're cleaning the cages, we dip our, our shoes into these foot baths to clean any potential um, viruses or bacteria off of our shoes. We wear gloves, things like that. 
So okay. it's still a big deal. Yeah, most definitely. So it looks like this one takes us back to uh, talking toucan um, mm -hmm. and the different coloration. So why might different toucan species have different coloration? Um, again, it could be identification of species. So, you know, if toucan A is different from toucan B, the female knows who is who. So um, I think it it's just, a you know, why is, you know, one sparrow different from another sparrow? It's just um, probably adapted and evolved uh, differently to attract a mate would be my best guess. I'm not an expert on two cans. Yeah. All right. Does anyone else out there have any more questions for Marcy? I see something in the chat here about pelagic seabirds have developed sense of smell. Seeing them offshore, they appear to be flying deliberately sometimes as if they know where fish congregations might be. Um, yeah, definitely. They have that advanced sense of smell. They also have pretty good vision for seeing those bird, those fish under the water. Mm. Um, they probably know where they are too, where they congregate, where the fish find food. The birds will congregate there. Great. There, I know there's so many different birds to talk about with different I variations. <laughs> yeah. Next time we'll do a whole lecture on, on eyesight, right? Um, nice. And someone also put in a, a message about uh, journeynorth.org is another website that you can watch to see where hummingbirds are being reported as they fly, Wonderful. as they fly north. So. Okay. Um. I see a couple so one more. question that I one question I had that was really is more related to the um you know backyard birds thinking about the backyard bird count but um you had mentioned that you know a lot of their their beak shapes are for for seeds um but sometimes you see like the chickadees grab a seed and then I notice they will fly to a branch they'll fly mm -hmm. off of the feeder or something and and use you know, is it that their beaks are too small to handle what they're getting or are they doing something different with the seeds? I think a lot of that is safety if they stay oh, at the okay. feeder, they're vulnerable. A lot okay. of hawks may treat a bird feeder like a buffet table. So a lot of them will yeah. grab a seed and go to the safety of the trees to eat their seed. So I think that's okay. a lot of it. Yeah. Okay. It's not that they need the branch to like get not the seed upon to break it open. Okay. Yeah. They just yeah, don't I think they don't want to be buffet. Yeah, I like that. <laughs> yeah. We don't want to be on the buffet line. All right. I think a couple um, more questions. There's a couple more QA. Um, yeah. Does a so does beak have a a name where the nares connect? Yeah, where um, I'm not quite sure what you're referring to, but the little fleshy part at the top of the beak, where the nares are, is called a cer, C E R E. I hope I'm pronouncing that right. That's what I say. Um, but that fleshy part right there, parrots have a lot of birds have that. So it's a little fleshy strip where the nostrils are. Um, is mm -hmm. called a cer. And we have a, a, a another question about avian flu. Um, is it best to not feed our backyard birds at this time? I know at one point it was suggested that we take down feeders. Mm -hmm. I would say to go ahead and feed them, but keep those feeders clean. It's probably a good idea every other day to take it down and give it a good scrubbing. Um, mm -hmm. Look up directions on how to best clean a bird feeder. Um, I don't know that you want to use anything particularly toxic to clean it. Uh, maybe a very dilute bleach solution. Don't quote me on that. But um, I would keep them clean. Um, depending on the type of feeder that you use, sometimes um, unused seed can grow mold and fungus. And that can be toxic as well. So it's, you know, any unused seed, when you're ready to clean it, don't put it back out, dump it and put fresh out and then just keep it clean. That's a great tip. Yeah. But I would say, go ahead and feed them. They need it. Yeah. All right, I'm checking both our Q&A and our chat to see if anything else popped up. I'll give everybody just another minute to see if there's anything to ask. 
Oh, there's a chat here, clean the feces from the feeder. Absolutely. And there's different types of feeders. If you use one of those tray feeders, that's just a big platform, the feces can accumulate on those. But if you use something that looks more like a house or a hopper feeder, the way that they stand on it, the feces are going to go off the edge. So that one is less likely to accumulate feces or a tube feeder as well. Mm -hmm. But each of them has their advantages and disadvantages. And there's some great sites on Cornell's page about the best type of feeder and the best type of seed to attract what type of bird. That's a whole mm -hmm. other discussion. So I would recommend right. looking at Cornell's website and Audubon's website um, for tips on the best feeders and the best seeds that you can use, depending on what you want to attract. Wonderful. Oh, here we go. Uh, I meant, is there a word for the part of the vulture's beak below the stair where both nears open up into the beak? Oh, okay. I don't think that there's a name for that, but it is true that if you were to look at a vulture's beak through the side, you can see right through the nostrils. They don't, there's no septum oh. in between the nostrils. So that is true. Interesting. But I don't know that there's a name for it. I'm not sure. Hmm. Is there a reason it is that way? Is it because of what they're eating or? I don't know. No. Yeah. Yeah. Really cool. Yeah. All right. Last call for questions. Well, while people are maybe thinking, Marcy, I just wanted to say thank you so much for pleasure. Um, being with us tonight and sharing all your knowledge. This was really interesting to think about some of our local birds, birds we might know, um, but birds that are not our everyday, like toucans and um, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. Yeah. So wonderful. And hopefully all of you will take advantage starting tomorrow, the Great Backyard Bird Count. Uh, looking at a little bit more information about that opportunity and um, hopefully counting some birds and contributing to, to eBird. One of our staff members at Jenkins, who's a big birder, she was talking about how um, maybe there's a little bit of competition between states about how many birds can be counted um, on the yeah. great backyard bird yeah. count. So <laughs> Wonderful. she was saying, we got we to gotta get out there so we can beat I think she said California. I was like, you go, girl. Oh, wow. <laughs> so, yeah, wonderful. Um, that last question is just says thank you, and we'll leave on that. Thank you, Marcy, for being with us tonight. My pleasure, sharing, Amy. Thank you for having sharing me. Sharing your information. And thank you, everyone, for sticking with us through the questions. And I'll share the recording when it's ready. All wonderful. right. Good night, everybody. Good night. Thank you so much. Bye. Bye-bye.